Hey everyone, I am Yvette Hampton, host of the Homegrown Generation Family Expo, and I am so glad that you are with us today for this bonus session with Peggy Ployer. Peggy is the founder and CEO of SPED Homeschool, a leader in the special education homeschooling community and a frequent writer and speaker on the special education homeschooling, um, on special homeschooling education issues, as well as the host of SPED Homeschool Conversations, a weekly talk show about special education homeschooling. So Peggy, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Beth. This is yeah. going to be fun. <laughs> yep. Yep. We are so thrilled. We, um, we, we've podcasted with you before and you and I have met and I love what you're doing with SPED Homeschool. I know that there are many parents who feel like they cannot homeschool because they have a child with special needs. Um, some of them are very extreme. Some of them are not very extreme at all, but they still need attention. Mm -hmm. And so you and I both know that oftentimes doctors will say, well, you know, they need to be put in this special class and they need to have this special attention and they need to have these special resources. Mm -hmm. And you have proven time and time again and worked with many, many families to show that that is not always necessary. Most of the time, mom can teach or dad can teach their child at home. They just need the resources that are available to them and they need the encouragement and the confidence to do that. So you are bringing to us today this bonus session called Homeschooling Your Struggling Learner with Confidence. Um, so thank you for joining us today. You're so welcome. And like, um, I told you before we started is this is just going to be a coffee conversation. This would be what um, what I know that so many parents need just to gain confidence because you do you have everything you need, but oftentimes we um, we forget the most important things that um, that are equipping us and giving us the confidence to make it through and to see our kids succeed because that's what we want. That's right. That's right. So, all right. Well, I am going to let you take it from here and bring your awesome. great encouragement, and then I will meet back up with you at the end. Great. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Um, I am excited to share with you um, what I've learned in the last 15 years of being a consultant with parents who homeschool children with special needs and also homeschooling and graduating to a my own three children already. And um, there are lots of times where we lose our confidence and we need somebody to put things back into perspective. And so um, even my team members come to me with the same, the same issues because we forget them so often. And so I just want this to be a reminder to you. If you've been homeschooling for a while, you can do this. You can do this confidently. And if you're just getting started, don't believe everything that everybody tells you, like the experts Yvette was talking about. Of, um, I have to, to rely on all this expert advice, and I am just a pawn in this whole scheme of my child's education, and that I really just don't even know what I'm doing, and I'm not best suited for this. I think we downplay our own role and our own selves way too much. Um, you truly are your child's expert, and I, I want to um, to really build up that confidence in you that you can do this and that there are resources out there to fill in those gaps that you have, but also that you can draw on things that those experts can't. And that is where you need to gain your greatest confidence because that is what is truly going to help your child succeed the most. And that's why we see so much failure in our special education system is because that part is taken out. And what am I talking about? Well, I'm going to cover five main things in this conversation. And the first one is the most important. It's your relationship with your child. And this is the part that gets removed when our children go to school. Yes, they have a relationship with their teacher, but you know, they don't live with their teacher. Their teacher doesn't know everything about them. Well, they got, you know, multiple kids in a classroom. They can't. Um, it's not their fault. But you as a parent do know your child very well. And there's, there's some issues that come into play when um, you've had your child going to a school, maybe even it's a preschool, and they start to be taught that mom and dad aren't the expert. 
but the teachers are the expert. And even subconsciously, they don't understand that this is what they're taking in. And so a lot of times when, if you're just starting homeschooling and you're realizing you're having this friction with your child, that could be one of the reasons. And I can't tell how many parents that I've been on the phone with who have said, what do I do? My child doesn't listen to me. Well, it's because they honor another teacher figure more than you. And that needs to be reestablished. Oftentimes when we talk about getting started homeschooling, we talk about de-schooling. And I want to encourage you, even if you've been homeschooling for a while and school and the curriculum has gotten in between you and your child, take a step back and do this again. Because de-schooling truly is about reestablishing your relationship with your child and making learning the core of what you're doing, not the curriculum. And so how do you do this? Well, we spend time. Time is important. It's not quality. Time is quantity. It's how much time can I invest in my child? And I know that's a really hard thing, especially for achievers like me, to, to do things like that, to show my children that they mean something, that mom wants to invest in their lives and not just invest the things that I think are important, but invest in the things that they think are important because that is what truly establishes honor. You know, when we are in a relationship or we're, we're put under the instruction of somebody and we don't trust that person, do we truly listen to what they're saying? Or do we kind of just put it in the back of our heads as kind of good advice that maybe I'll draw from later? Well, your kids do the same thing with you. If you <laughs> are so worried about other things and don't invest time with them. I learned that to establish the greatest amount of honor with my kids, that I did that while putting on superhero costumes and running around my house while building Legos and and going shopping with my daughter to, to thrift things that she's making wild clothes out of. So, um, but that is their interest or was their interest when they were younger. And, and there is where they saw mom cares. She doesn't care just about the things that she cares about. She cares about me. She cares about my stuff. And so I am going to honor her in return because I can now trust her. And, and that's when schooling starts to click even more. And we find this especially true when children have had a really hard time in school and we have pushed them and pushed them hard and say, I know you can do this. And it happens even in our home schools. It doesn't just happen in public and private schools is that we push them to the brink of them shutting down. And that relationship first and foremost needs to be reestablished before we can expect our child to really start learning from us again. So if you're at this frustration point with your child, and this often happens around age 10, and the, the kind of the preteen years, and then the teen years, especially for boys, um, that they just have this kickback because that is when they reorient relationships in their lives. And you need to come back to the top. And it's well worth it. I promise you, because now that my boys are adults and when they have issues, guess what? They message mom because mom's an important person in their life still. And so if you want to look at it even long term, relationship matters and it's worth the investment because it's going to affect all of your homeschooling. So that's my first point for you. My second one is about advocacy and resources. Now, Advocacy means I ask for help when I need it, and I let others know what I need as far as help. <laughs> and the resources are the actual helps. Oftentimes, we get these two mixed up because we first look for the resources without really realizing what do I need for resources and why do I need them? Because the first question that comes out of many people's mouths when they first start homeschooling and when they start struggling with their child is, what curriculum do you use? Because they want to switch curriculum. Because curriculum must be the problem and it must be the solution. The problem is, is it's not. There's lots of good resources out there. 
And if you were to ask me and my team, who of all homeschooled children with special needs, what curriculum we use, we've all used different ones and they've all been successful. <laughs> the thing is, is there's many different factors involved in picking the right instructional method and the right helps you need as a parent to homeschool your child. But you have to figure out what those are before you start asking questions about what curriculum should I use and all the other stuff that I need to make this work. So here's some things you have to, I wanna give you to think through as you're, you're thinking about that. Um, first of all, what do you need as a teacher? And what works for you to teach your student and what wouldn't? Now, this is really important because you're the one who's opening up the books and figuring out the lesson. And if it doesn't work for you, it's not gonna work. I have found that I bought curriculum and never used it because it was so complicated to figure out. It just made my brain spin and I couldn't do it. I just had to walk away. <laughs> I find I am a much more creative person. I like curriculum gives me options, but not must do's. Some people, may prefer it totally different. They want a step-by-step -step guide on what they do to teach us every lesson. That's great. That's wonderful to know about yourself. If I had that, that would have been curriculum that got thrown out the door for me. But when you start realizing what you need, then you can go to conferences and curriculum fairs. You can open up books and say, does this have what I need to teach my child? and what helps I need on my end to make me be successful in this process. Next thing to look at is what does your schedule look like? Some people can school every day of the week, some can't. Is it flexible enough that I don't have to have all these lessons that have to go day to day to day, five days a week in order to make them work? Um, or maybe if I have five days, that's perfect and it will work for me. But, but think about your schedule and how many hours a week and even a day do I need to invest per subject um, or based on the, the plan that's laid out in the curriculum. Can I tweak it or can't I? And is, again, that going to fit with all the other things we have going on in our lives? Because remember, you may have therapies to work into that. You may have doctor's appointments to work in that. You may have to take large gaps because of an upcoming surgery that your child has scheduled. Yes, these are things that we have to think of. In addition, that many curriculum providers don't think about, but if they're designed flexible enough, they will work around what you need to work around, but you have to make sure that they do, again, before you invest in them. And then finally, does your child respond to it? That's usually the first question people ask, but it's really the last one you need to ask. Because even if your child responds to some kind of input method very well, it may not be the best instructional method. I'm gonna give you an example. So my boys love video games and I thought, great, they need to learn typing we'll just buy a game that will teach them how to type. This is when I learned the error of my ways <laughs> and never did this again because the mindset of my children when they play a video game is to win it, to level up, to go through it as fast as possible. The problem is with typing, typing is something that you learn as you do it over and over and over again and it's not something you rush through. So was that the proper instructional method for what I was trying to teach? No, it was not. Eventually, we had to throw away the game. And I went to the library, and they were thankfully selling one of those old typing books from the high school and that you had the flip pages on that sat next to their desk, and that is how they learned to type. And it worked flawlessly because they just had one thing to do a day, they could check it off on their list and, and they learned to type. So, um, so again, input 
Understanding your child's best input methods is important, but also take it in the context of what you're teaching and if that would really work with um, what they're doing. Again, a lot of games too. Another thing I wanna point out is a lot of games test, they don't teach. And especially math is where you're gonna see that. Um, so if you're using a math program, make sure that it has an instructional component to it as well. It's not just shoot the right answer because that's not actually teaching them concepts and instructing them in mathematical processes. All it's doing is making sure they get the right answer. If um, And for memorizing math facts, that's great. But for a lot of other things in math, it's not so great. So things to take into consideration, definitely. So now, as you're actually looking at curriculum and asking that important question, what curriculum should I use? <sighs> I wanna address one more question that we get. And this is the number one question that we've been receiving as we've been at conferences the last couple of years is, well, this is the diagnosis of my child. So what curriculum would work best for them? And I can't tell you how much that drives my team lead crazy <laughs> because she's like, Peggy, how do I answer that? Um, because every child with the same diagnosis is not the same. They don't live in the same house. And even though a curriculum for a child on the autism spectrum may work for one family, it's not gonna work for the other. Again, based on what I just talked about, your teaching method, your schedule, and your child's input methods that they learn from best. So again, Yes, it's a diagnosis. It will give you something to work from, usually on what your child does well at, what they struggle with. Um, but those are again factors to take in. That isn't the determining factor for how you choose curriculum. So again, I said, people on my team as well as I have used all different curriculums. But there are some commonalities among the curriculums that we have used that work for the majority of families who homeschool children with special needs. They're usually flexible. They provide different options so that um, you can teach a method using a tactile, auditory, a visual method. They give you lots of different input methods because oftentimes a child who struggles will not click with a learning concept sometimes the first time you teach them. You need to teach them from a different direction. And if the curriculum provider is giving you those, it's less work you need to do on your end looking for other things to use to reteach that concept in a different way. And so, um, so there are some curriculums that do offer that. And um, again, there, there's lots of reviews out there. We've vetted organizations as well as on, on our website and have lots of partner organizations that have those. Um, so flexible schedules, again, back to that. Um, and you can, you can check that out. Investments. Some curriculum costs a lot of money. And sometimes it's worth the money because, again, it's going to save you time. And it depends on what you weigh out as being most important. So if there's a curriculum you're looking at, no matter what it costs, get samples of it, try it out in your homeschool, see if it works for you. So I started homeschooling many years ago. There was not a whole lot of curriculum out there when I started, but I knew there were three main methods. The first method that I looked at was textbooks. Yeah, that's an option. Um, the second one was more of a literacy based and the other was a unit study. And so I decided to test it out. Maybe you want to do this too. This is a good thing to do if you're um, just getting started and saying, well, we have some de-schooling time. Let's try this. So I decided on a theme. Our theme was pirates. And so I decided I would find a textbook and read my kids, you know, the textbook description of what a pirate was. And so we spent one afternoon talking about that and they filled out you know, coloring pages. A lot of times textbooks have coloring pages and things like that. Well, that didn't go over too well. So 
I got some literature based on pirates. My kids thought that was kind of fun, you know, read, read story books about pirates and we'll, we'll do that. Um, so I thought, okay, well, that might be a hit because we tried that out. And then we got to the, the next day, the unit study. And I, um, I said to my kids, okay, so we're going to learn rope tying because sailors needed to tie all these different kinds of knots. Problem is, is you're not just going to learn from the book how to tie the knots. You're going to use this 20 feet of cord and you can tie me up as long as you use the proper knots. Well, that was great fun. I enjoyed the creative side of it, the fun part of it. So did my kids. And we ended up doing unit studies all the way through high school for my oldest because of that experiment. So I want you to think about this as you're looking at curriculum and saying, what'll work best for us? Try it. Try it. You don't have to invest in it first to see if it works. A lot of curriculum companies will give you samples free on their website. If they don't, call them and say, I'd love to try it out. Um, some even give you a, tr a free trial. So, um, and also don't think that it has to be accredited in order to work because um, very few state laws actually require accredited curriculum. And so, um, so definitely check with your state laws, but um, most times accredited curriculum will not work with the struggling learner because it's very set on pace and it's set on all subjects being taught at the same level. And it makes it very difficult for a child who struggles, especially in one area or maybe even all. So um, something to, to think about. Another thing that you can draw on as far as resources are consultants. And consultants can be extremely helpful if you have a child who struggles. Now, are you a member of HSLDA, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association? If you are, guess what? You already have access to consultants included in your membership. Yes, their struggling learner consultants are accessible to you whenever you want them. That's included with your membership and you can call them up, say, I'm looking at this curriculum and this is what my child's dealing with. Is this a good choice? Um, you can also ask them to help review testing um, records that you have maybe that you brought home from the school when you withdrew your student or that you had done by an independent tester or done by the school district as a homeschooler. You can often ask the school district to test your students. Um, that's again, depending on your state law, but, um, but they can help you set up goals for your students. They can um, help you pick curriculum and, and kind of get you started in that direction. If you're not a member of HSLDA and you prefer to go to more independent route, there are a lot of private consultants you can hire that will help you do that exact same thing and um, they all have different rates, but you can find them. You'll find them on our website, um, but they will be able to help you get started. If you need somebody long term, they're willing to walk with you long term as well through all the ups and downs of your homeschooling. They will be your, your constant resource. Or if you feel like I just need somebody to jumpstart me, get me going, and then I'm, I'm good to go. They can be there for that as well. So, so those are some options if you, you think, I just need somebody to come alongside me for a little while. Consultants are a great option in that respect. And then finally, instructional materials for you, mom and dad. There's a lot of them out there. How do I homeschool? Well, there's curriculum companies that actually have consultants that teach you how to use their curriculum and or they have videos on how to do that and so draw on those invest in yourself as a teacher and i know that's really hard because oftentimes we're investing so much in our child but again back to that um that that example that's used so much about if you don't put that oxygen mask on yourself first then you won't be ready to put the oxygen mask on your child the same thing with homeschooling a struggling learner. It's not as easy as just flying by the seat of your pants and making it work every day. Sometimes you can do that. Um, but a lot of times you need to be taught how to teach. I learned so much from my team members that were special ed teachers and they'll even tell you, 
I still had more to learn. I taught special ed, one of my team members taught special ed for over a decade in the schools. And now she's being faced with things with her own children that she's never experienced and she has to relearn it. We are all in a learning process and we have to keep learning alongside our children and learning how to teach them. So, um, so you can, you can go to the curriculum providers for education. Um, that's why I do my interview every week. I interview different experts and um, do a broadcast because there are so many good methods out there that can help you to teach your child better. And um, we want to make that possible for you. So I'm learning every week and I hope you learn with me. Anyways, so um, those are some things as far as resources go that are available to you. And most of them are free. So, um, so definitely utilize them. And so the next thing I want to talk about is learning tangents. Now, <laughs> this was something I had no clue about when I first started homeschooling, but I had to learn about it very quickly because I had children that struggled and who thought school was really hard. And um, it especially became clear to me after what I had done in my own homeschool, other parents were taking a different route because when I focused on learning tangents, they focused on removing everything else. Now here's what, what I mean. So, um, I would have parents call me as a consultant and say, Peggy, my child struggles in reading and they can't finish their reading with all the other things. So I've removed all the other subjects from their school and they still can't finish their reading. And I have a hard time holding my tongue about why did you do that? <laughs> and instead say, would you like it? if the one thing you hated most in your day was the only thing you had to focus on. I know if someone told me that I had to clean my house every day when I got up, I would roll over and go back to bed because that's the one thing I hate to do the most. And so, um, unfortunately we do this to our children when they struggle in school is we think if we cut out everything else, it'll just make it easier for them. Well, no, it makes it, the one thing that they have to look at all day long. So let's create some learning tangents and some other things that we can put into their school that make it more fun and make them succeed and see that they can accomplish things. So for my children, my oldest struggled so much in reading. He didn't learn to read until he was 10. And um, we just did his lessons every day and plowed through. He loved audiobooks. And so I would give him audiobooks to listen to, and we would keep doing the phonics and, you know, struggle through it. Well, the wonderful side of the story is at age 11, the state that we lived in required us to do testing every year. So I know this from his testing is that at age 11, he was reading at a college level. He made that jump in one year. We sometimes allow fear that my child's not going to get caught up. They're not going to be able to do this. If I just, we get <laughs> so wrapped up in what they're not doing that we forget to focus on what they really can do and what they're really good at. So for my son, what I did was I built engineering into his school. And as part of his curriculum one year, we did mechanical engineering. And he built historical bridges using a connect set. And then it made it easier when he saw that on his schedule for school, that he pressed through the reading to get to the thing that he wanted to do even more. And so oftentimes what I tell parents to do is add more, add more to their schedule. Things that you may not even consider a subject to what they're doing during their day because that is where they're gonna see success. And you just never know. Like with my son, yeah, he loved Legos, he loved Connects, he loved those things. Did I know he was gonna be an engineer and that next semester he'll be graduating with a degree in biomedical engineering? No, but God did. And so, yes, put in those things that they love because you never know what they're gonna learn from them 
that'll push them on to where they're going. So, um, so just follow their interests. It may seem completely ridiculous to you to add that as um, a subject in their school, especially when they're young. I think when they get older, we we tend to see, you know, cooking and sewing and all those crafty, you know, different things that they do, auto mechanics as appropriate school, but not maybe when they're in grade school. But why not? We could do that. Um, and plus, you don't even have to think of a creative name for it to put on their transcripts like you do in high school. <laughs> so, um, so do that. Because what you're going to see is that your student is going to start realizing, oh, I'm good at things. Because they may struggle in every academic subject that exists. But they may just flourish in other things that you then put into school. And I'm not a, an unschooler, um, but I think there is a point to to adding some things in that your children love and that they direct the learning for. And you may need to go out and get outside experts because you're not the expert in this and you can't teach it at all. You may need to find a club and, um, and find a group of people that love that thing to do. I know I've driven 20 miles each way to take my daughter to an art school in downtown Houston because that is her love. And um, that has paid off huge benefits. We don't do it every semester, but when there are semesters that they offer classes that she finds could be useful, we do. Um, and it may just be enlisting the help of a friend and that has that interest and knowledge and you don't. So, so think outside the box as well. And don't think I have to be the expert or I have to find the resource that I can teach somebody else can too. And it can be just an activity that they do that you count as school. Put it in their planner, whatever you do used for their school and, um, and make them see that it's important. That's what's most, um, most important is that they see that is just as important as reading and math. And, um, and they'll push through, they'll, they'll, they'll continue to grow in those things. And um, oftentimes we we don't even do this in high school. And I think that's another thing I, I want to address is that we see the academics as so essential. Yet I've learned now that I've graduated too, that the most important things that my children learned, yes, they know how to do math at different levels based on what they were able to accomplish and read, um, but knowing themselves and knowing what they liked, what they didn't like, and um, and who they were as a person, and what they excelled at. And um, those were probably the most important things, other than the relationship with us <laughs> as their parents and each other, um, when they can continue learning all those academic subjects through the rest of their lives. But, um, but can they make wise choices? On their own and a lot of times those things center on who am I and do I know myself and do can I fall back on the relationships and people that I trust um, do I have people to trust so back to those two points so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is called uh, the peace factor for decision making <sighs> oftentimes we don't know what to do we're kind of at an impasse, whether we're just beginning homeschooling and we go, I've got so many options. Yeah, <laughs> that's nice. Um, maybe, but maybe sometimes too many options is not a good thing either. I know when I started schooling, homeschooling, I had no options, hardly, <laughs> for homeschooling a struggling learner. And now there's way too many. And it's still the same problem. So how do you make a decision? And then you have all this expert advice coming at you saying, do this, this is what works for my child. This is what this study says. And then maybe 10 years later, they're gonna to totally disprove that study and give you some new information. <laughs> How do you know what to do? I've had parents on the other side of the phone with me many times asking me the same question. And the thing that I've learned over and over again 
as to how to respond to that is where do you have peace? If you don't have peace in something, it's not what God has intended. If you feel uneasy, if you feel agitated, if you feel you need to rush in to do something, that is not what you're supposed to do. Um, God created your child. He knows exactly what your child needs and exactly when your child needs that. And he will always provide if you ask. And if he provides when you ask, take it, run with it, do it. You will look back many years from now and say, yes, that was exactly what I was supposed to do. If he doesn't give you anything and you're in this time of waiting, don't just put things in that seem to make sense to you. And again, it doesn't give you peace. Because a lot of times when I found myself doing that, I ended up having to backtrack. And um, instead of focusing on my child, I was focusing on the anxiety that was welling up inside me because they weren't doing this on the timeline that I thought they should. And they weren't keeping up with their peers as everybody told me they should be doing. And when we did those types of things, I actually created more frustration in my child and myself and things that we had to go back and repair instead of being able to move on and to, to jump into with a lot of energy and be ready to go into as the right solution that God provided at the right time. So, um, so definitely think about that as you have different things coming up and you're making decisions about, you know, what am I going to do for curriculum? What am I going to do for therapy? What am I going to do about my child making friends? Pray, ask. Peace will lead you. Peace will lead you in the right direction. I promise. So, um, Oh, and I also want to address this too. Sometimes God gives you the craziest ways to resolve your peace. And you think, why would I use that in my homeschool? And let me tell you, every time that I have followed his advice in doing some kind of crazy things, I have seen the payback. Okay, I want to share an example. So my oldest, not my oldest, my second oldest, kind of had a burnout in high school. And he ended up his last year of high school, podcasting, video editing, video recoloring, doing a whole bunch of video stuff and graduating. Well, then he started working for my nonprofit. Guess what? I needed somebody who was good at podcasting and editing <laughs> and, um, and all of those things that he was very well versed in. And, um, and what if I would have just really pressed in with him and it would have created a divide in our relationship. I know for sure, because it already was. And I wouldn't have had that year of him working for a nonprofit when we first started, um, to develop a closer relationship with him, to, to help him see how much he had gifts in those areas and that he could build on those and that he had ideas and he thought differently than other people and that that was a benefit to employers and that he needed to remember that when he went on to his next job. So, so those are things to just keep in the back of your mind when you're going, do I just do what everybody else is doing when I don't feel peace about it? Or do I do what God's telling me to do, even though it seems totally and absolutely ridiculous? Go with the ridiculous. It'll work. I promise. <laughs> so um, the last thing that I want to talk about is goals and scheduling. So setting goals, if you listen to any expert, they're going to tell you, if you set over three goals, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Because our human nature is we can't focus on more than, than three. So set your goals wisely, firstly, for your student, because those are the things that you're going to focus on over and over again. And they could be some pretty broad goals or they could be rather specific. 
And again, these goals don't have to last for the whole year <clears throat> for your student. I'm just finishing up writing a whole chapter on transition planning for high schoolers. And goals are huge because they're what you set at the beginning of their high school career to say, this is where they're going to end up at their high, the end of the high school career. And are we going to be able to do what we need to do to get there? Well, sometimes those goals are set to just get you a skill that maybe they can learn in a week or two weeks. Or maybe they're goals that they have to work on for a long time and maybe social skills or other things like that, that you need to work bit by bit by bit at to get to that end goal. But whatever it is, if you don't have a goal, you're really kind of going nowhere. Oftentimes we allow curriculum to do this for us, <clears throat> but if you have a child that struggles, oftentimes you're pulling in lots of different kinds of curriculum to reach one single goal. So, um, so make sure you've written those down. Figure out ways that you can measure them so that you're not going, are we really doing things that are leading us to where we want to go? Or are we just doing school? Um, a lot of times we're just doing school. But if you're purposeful in setting those goals and taking time out to measure what you're doing, then um, you, can, you can see that there's progress happening. And a lot of times people use consultants for this as well. Um, you can get testing and not just standardized testing. Standardized testing rates your child against a norm based on a certain level that they're being tested at. There are other tests out there that exist that test your child on a standard base of knowledge and compare their test scores to where they were last time on that same standard set of knowledge. Those are the types of tests you want to use, especially if you're doing academic goal setting, um, because then you're going to see where they're progressing at different in different academic areas. So um, again, that's a good way to to outsource that if you feel like, well, I don't even know where to start. Um, but but again, if you're working with a consultant that's helping you set specific goals, they oftentimes will help you also set up the measurable part of it and how to measure that on a regular basis so that you see progress is being made. And if no progress is being made, that's when you change up your teaching method or you take a break because your child has hit a plateau and they're just really not comprehending things until you get to the next place. Um, learning plateaus are a totally different thing. I just want to address this really quick, but we often think that kids learn on this nice EV steady scale because that's the way we see it mathematically written for um, standardized tests or other things. Actually, your children will take in data like this and then spike when everything clicks. And so oftentimes you're not going to see anything for a while. And so don't get frustrated when testing first shows that they're not doing anything. Like my son, when we kept doing grammar over and over and over again and in phonics and he wasn't reading, we kept doing it. Yeah. And he learned to read. And <laughs> same thing happened with writing. I even told Andrew Puto about this. We used IEW. My son learned all the basics of how to write a paper. Never wrote one for me because he didn't see the purpose in it. But when he went to college, he got A's in English because he knew how to write. Um, sometimes it takes a little while and sometimes you just have to press through. Again, I had peace with continuing that even though I was seeing no results. I followed my peace. Again, that's one of those crazy things. So um, just in general, know that um, you can do it. And that's, that's what you just need to, to focus on is the more confidence that you have, the more confidence your child's going to have in themselves and their education is going to be more fruitful because of what you're doing, whether you think you're doing a good job or not. Oftentimes we see teachers in schools and we we think, oh, I should just put my kid back in school because I am failing right now. Well, you know what? Special ed teachers do the same thing you do on a regular basis. They just don't verbalize it. <laughs> they just try a new method and they keep pressing on. And that's what we need to do. We need to just keep pressing on, finding those things that work for our kids, using them, and then moving on to the next thing when that doesn't work anymore. 
or holding on to it if it is working. Um, so I just want to wrap this up with um, just reminding you that sometimes we just need to back up. We need to focus on relationship. Sometimes we need to back it up even further and pray and say, what is it that is really the struggling point in my homeschool? And why am I not confident? Um, if I've got all these things and all these resources, where am I falling short? And what am I not using correctly? Or what am I not seeing properly? And oftentimes, the most skewed thing that happens in our homeschools is we start looking at what's coming out of it versus what's happening in it. And so I just really want you to focus on what's going on that's going right and be thankful for that. Um, and hi, Beth. Hi. <laughs> my sound go again or am I still here? No, 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 no. This is great. Okay. So, so I'm just going to wrap up with just a few more things if that's okay. Yeah, go on. All right. So every child's different. And I know you know that, you know, you've got two children and I'm sure homeschooling them is, you know, different. And for everybody, our schedules are different. And so um, what works for your family may not work for another family. And what works for another family may not work for you. And um, if school starts at 8 a.m. versus noon, that's really okay, right? <laughs> I remember being on a panel and one mom said, we don't start school till three in the afternoon. And I went, oh, you too? <laughs> I had teenagers, they slept till afternoon. And um, that was okay. Um, but if therapy is the majority of your school, that's okay too. Um, or of character training. I remember so many days where all my kids did was fight and all we learned to do was get along. <laughs> and, and I think the benefit of that is they're each other's best friends now. And I couldn't have done that any other way. Um, if your child needs two to three years to finish a curriculum that's written for one year, that's okay. And I remember the first time I said that at a conference, I heard parents gasp <laughs> and say, what? Yes, it really is okay because that's the pace your child's learning at. The more you push them through things, just to get it done in the timeline that the curriculum says it's supposed to be done is not gonna help them at all. And um, if you need a tutor to help teach, hire them if you can. Figure out a way to barter if you have to. Um, I tutor my neighbor boy down the street in algebra because his mom can't. And um, we have a good relationship. <laughs> so, um, so find those. And, and she prayed, that's how she found me. I didn't even know her before that. So, um, but if you have to homeschool without a co-op because your child can't function in one, that's okay too. And so is working on life skills as a majority of your school or um, just doing what you think is best when other people are opposing you. I think those are, those are the big takeaways. And um, just know that you can do it, but you have to be confident. Confident that... Um, However you're doing it is the right way. It doesn't have to look like everybody else. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That was so good. So, you know, as, as a mom um, who doesn't deal with special needs in particular with my kids, mm -hmm. um, you've been so encouraging to me. Everything you said, there's not been a single thing that you've said where I'm like, well, that doesn't pertain to me. It all pertains to me. So I know that every parent watching this will be so blessed by, um, your message. And, and I, yeah. I love that you talk so much about relationships and building those relationships. And that is really the most important thing. Um, well, the most important thing is pointing our kids to Jesus. Um, yes. But the one of the ways we do that is by building that relationship with them first. Right. And so it really is so important to build that relationship. And, and I love that you talked about how God created each one of our children so uniquely and, and so special. And yeah. God made them exactly as they are. And no one knows them better than mom and dad. And so no one can meet their needs better than we can as their parents. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with the help of God and lots of prayer and community around us and resources, all the many resources that you listed, um, we can do this for sure. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Peggy, thank you so, so much. Um, really quickly talk mm -hmm. about SPED Homeschool, what your ministry is, and then where people can find you. 
Sure, yeah. So Spent Homeschool is a nonprofit, and we formed um, about two and a half years ago just because there was no place that parents could go for reliable information. And so we are a resource and curriculum vetting organization that helps parents to find the best resources out there and find them quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that you can confidently go ahead and homeschool. And so we have um, lots of articles. Um, our board of directors is amazing. I, the people I get to work with. Um, and and but we have yeah a podcast, the live live broadcast. We have articles. Um, we just we have lots of free downloadables and templates that we're adding to. We have books that are coming out this year that I'm excited about. Um, just lots of lots of different things that will um, equip and encourage parents to homeschool special education and okay. be confident in that. Awesome. And and really quickly, who are some of the, the team members? Because you, I know through your whole thing, you were talking about our team and I know who some of them are. Uh, but well, who are and some I just of added three new volunteers in the last month. So oh, wow. Okay. Wonderfully exciting. But yes, um, my team is Cami Arn and um, Amy um, Vickery. I'm going to probably forget somebody here. Um, Don Spence. They've been with me the longest, Shannon Romero. And then I've got um, Nikisha Blaine just joined as well as JC um, Clark and um, Ashley, who lives in Arizona. I'm blanking on her last name. But um, but yeah, they each have different roles. They're all volunteers. We are all volunteers, even me. Mm -hmm. And um, and then our board of directors, our new board president for 2020 is Steve Demi. And so he will be put up on our website as of um, January. And then, uh, yeah, we've just got, like I said, a great board, Kathy Cool and um, Jan Bedell and Faith Barons from HSLDA. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, just... Okay. A great group to work with. And yeah. Diane Craft is okay. my treasure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You do have a great, you have a very, very strong team there. So mm -hmm. thank you for what you are doing. You are providing much hope to parents who really need it. They really need that encouragement and that hope yeah, um, for homeschooling uh, their mm -hmm. kids. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for joining us for the Homegrown Generation Family Expo. Thank and you. thank you guys for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. And mm -hmm. we will. Uh, Talk to you hopefully sometime again soon, Peggy. We'll have you back on the podcast yeah. again and uh, good. get to talk uh, a little bit more about this. So thank you guys. Have a great day. Yeah, bye.